All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today we're chatting with Dr. William Lane Craig and Dr. Ryan Mullins on God, time, creation, and everything in between. Aquí lo correcto es eh, sobre Dios, tiempo, la creación, y todo lo demás. Uh, while I myself have much to say on these topics, uh, my goal today is going to be to play a moderating role. And I'm going to be short with the introduction because most of my audience will know both of you guys, both of my guests. But Dr. William Lane Craig is a philosopher and theologian who has published widely in philosophy of religion, philosophy of time, metaphysics, and more. Likewise, Dr. Ryan Mullins is a theologian and philosopher who publishes primarily in analytic theology and philosophy of time. So thank you guys both for coming on. I'm very excited for this. Ahí dijo que nada más estaba muy emocionada por esto. El extranjero aquí, no sé por qué le puso eso. The first segment of this video is defining our terms. So let's begin with time, firstly. Uh, Dr. Craig affirms a relational theory of time, whereas Dr. Mullins affirms the absolute theory of time. And we're going to need some clarity on these terms before looking at arguments for and against each view. So, Dr. Craig, can you tell us a little bit about the relational theory of time? Certainly. I think that the contrast to be drawn here, Joe, is between a relational theory of time and a substantival view of time. The word absolute uh, in these debates is used so many different ways that the term is ambiguous or, or multivalent. And so I don't think it's helpful to draw this distinction as relational versus absolute. Rather, the distinction is between a view that thinks of time as a substance, uh, something that actually exists, as opposed to a relational view that sees time as a relation of before and after between events. And I myself actually am very open to either view But I tend not to believe. Aquí es. Estoy muy, estoy muy abierto a cualquiera de esas, de esas perspectivas. No, ustedes lo quiten esto, no. Estoy muy abierto a cualquiera de esas posturas, pero tiendo a creer, a no creer. If the time is a substance, a thing, uh, and that therefore it's plausibly a relation of before and after that arises from the occurrence of events. I just want to make sure I'm getting it just right. So it's not a thing in your ontology. Time is not a thing in your ontology. It's just a relationship between events of before and after. Yeah. Okay. Craig's right. Like when you look at all the literature, absolutes used in a million different ways. Yeah. So substance. Uh, dijo que cuando miras a la, litera, la, la literatura, en este caso sobre filosofía del tiempo, el término absoluto eh, se usa de un millón de maneras diferentes. Ivalism usually is a better way to go because that is actually the claim when you look at Eastern and Western philosophers throughout history, they're going to say that time is an actual substance. And so typically what they'll say in the Eastern and Western philosophy is that time is an eternal and uncaused substance and it plays several different roles. And then there's precedence within Christianity and Hinduism, maybe Islam. Uh, I've been trying to talk to some different scholars on this. Uh, there's precedent to say that time should be identified with God. So you see this in Henry Moore, you see this in Isaac Newton and Samuel Clark, and then you see this in Raghunath Sharomani in the, in the Hindu tradition. And then what the absolute theory does is they'll make a distinction between time and moments of time. So a moment of time is the way things are, but could be subsequently otherwise. And so here's the big idea. So time plays three big roles. First, it's the it, time is the thing that makes change possible. And then second, uh, time is the source of moments. And then third, time is the thing that unifies a series of moments into a coherent timeline. And so on this sort of kind of like Newtonian or Morian view that I'm, that I'm wanting to defend, I want to say that God should be identified with time. And this is because God is an eternal uncaused substance that makes change possible. So given God's power and freedom, change is possible. And then further, God is the source of moments because God all alone prior to creation That's a particular way that things are. Porque Dios eh, se encuentra completamente solo antes de la creación o completamente solo sin la creación. 
and given his eternal power and freedom, that's the way things are, but could be subsequently otherwise. So, because God could subsequently otherwise be otherwise if he chooses to exercise his power and his freedom to like, do something different, to create something. And then further, I want to say that God's the thing that unifies a series of moments into a coherent timeline. So whatever theory of providence you want to affirm, you want to be a theological determinist, you want to be a Molinist, you want to be an open theist, it doesn't matter. Whatever theory of providence you tell, that's the story of how God goes about organizing or arranging the different moments into a successive uh, series or a timeline. That's, that's the big idea. Yeah. So Dr. Craig, if you want to ask him like clarifying questions before we go on to like reasons to believe these, you can. And now if you want to do that. It sounds to me like pantheism uh, to identify time with God sounds pantheistic. So I wouldn't be surprised to see this in Hinduism. But Ryan, I think it's certainly not Isaac Newton's view. Uh, Newton was explicit uh, that time is an emanative effect of God's being. Um, and so I'd like to know, uh, why not affirm with Newton that God is the emanative cause of time and space, rather than that he is identical with time? Uh, que es en lugar de, eh, de que Dios sea idéntico, a, idéntico al tiempo. Time. That would allow you to affirm the sort of things that you just did affirm, but it wouldn't identify God and time, which seems to me to be a move we are not to make. Mm -hmm. So we have two different claims here. One, interpretations about uh, Newton, and then two, uh, the charge of pantheism. So pantheism says that God and the world are identical to each other. Uh, on the move that the Sharomani and these others are making, when they're saying that there's time and then there's moments of time, there's a distinction there. And then there's things that occur at moments or exist at moments. So there's a bunch of more distinctions there. So you and I, we exist at particular moments. We're not identical to moments and moments aren't identical to time. So we've got all sorts of distinctions. And so nothing here is being identical to God. So just saying time is like a mode or an attribute uh, is, is kind of the way it's typically spelled out. Oh, oh, but you did say that time is identical to God. I thought that was what yeah. you just that yeah, so time is, but moments of time are not identical to time, because uh, historically, this view distinguishes these two things. Mm -hmm. Aren't moments of time components of time? Those are the parts or intervals into which time can be divided? I, I want to deny this, because I want to say uh, moments of time are contingent features of, of, of reality. Uh, most of them are, other than like maybe like the first moment or something. Um, because again, there's time and then there's this other stuff called these moments and time is the source of these moments. Mm -hmm. And I don't but, understand why I should think they're in a part whole relationship. Um, mainly because I don't, when I, when I look at part whole relationships outside of material objects, I lose my grasp of what we're talking about very fast in any literal sense. And since we're talking about an immaterial God and moments, which a lot of times people take moments to be abstract to. Should I take those to be literal parts? I don't know. It sounds weird. Well, I think we can think of moments as intervals of time, um, and they could be various durations of time. Um, and so it would seem to me that moments would be intervals into which time can be divided, which would be one more reason I wouldn't want to identify God with time. But you are thinking of moments as something that's different from intervals of time, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I guess the way I would see intervals, intervals would be a set of moments. Because I think... To I dijo, yeah, uh, supongo que la manera en la que yo veo los intervalos, <laughs> eh, que los intervalos serían un conjunto de momentos. I think temporal relationships are between moments. Porque pienso que... La relación temporal son entre momentos. Uh, mm -hmm. is, is typically how I'm going to see it. So this is like the way like Ulrich Mayer and, um, and uh, Kit Fine start to, to kind of define things. Um, so it's a very different way of looking at it than, than some, some, uh, some of the like kind of the, like the 20th century analytic philosophy has looked at things. Um, but yeah, should we get on to the, the Newton claim though? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Emily Thomas's book, uh, Absolute Time, Riffs in modern british philosophy 
So she tries to give a different interpretation of Newton. So she looks through all these letters of Newton, uh, a lot of correspondence that he had to put different people. Uh, ahí dijo, por lo que revisa las distintas cartas de Newton, no las letras de Newton, las cartas, la mucha correspondencia de Newton. And she says, when you're looking at the, these claims about emanative uh, effects, uh, emanated, emanation and emanative causes, she's like, there's a particular way that a lot of the moderns are using that term. And so her claim, this is her claim, and I'm just following hers, is that the way that should be interpreted is, is attributes are imitate, emanative effects of substances. And she gives a lot of textual evidence for this in a bunch of different thinkers. Um, so she acknowledges up front, this is a, there's a debate about how to interpret these things. But I think she has a very interesting, long interpretative uh, uh, argument for why that's the case. So she gives a lot of textual evidence. But Por lo que brinda mucha evidencia textual. Aquí no es sexual. Ahí se le resbaló al traductor. Eh, por lo que ella brinda mucha evidencia textual. But yeah, it, there is a debate here to be had about the right way to interpret Newton. Okay, um, so I think that's that's good by way of clarifying questions on these two views, the relational versus the substantival view for the audience. Again, the relational view essentially says that time is a relation between events, whereas the substantival view says that time is a substance in some manner. And Ryan gave further characterizations and roles that it plays, like making change possible, being the source of moments, etc. Okay, so now that we've got the distinction on the table, we can now go to some reasons to think that each respective view is correct. So we're going to begin with Dr. Craig, and I guess we can ask, maybe what are some of the motivations, or like, what's your main motivation, Dr. Craig, for thinking that the relational view of time is true? Well, I don't have any knockdown argument for uh, which way to think of time. Um, in my work on God and time, this was one of the questions that I didn't have time to explore uh, adequately because I was so preoccupied with what I think is the far more important question of whether time is tensed or tenseless. It seems to me that that's the real watershed issue and that ultimately it makes no difference uh, to God's relationship to time, whether we think of time as a substance or as a, a relation. I just have real trouble thinking of times being a substance, um, especially if time is tensed. Substances endure through time, but time doesn't endure through time. So it seems to me that it's just a category mistake to think of time as a substance. Now, Ryan would make time a substance by identifying time with God. And as I've already expressed my misgivings about this, I, I think this is quite wrong. Um, time is one-dimensional and has the geometrical properties of a line. God does not. Time can be divided into moments which elapse. Aquí es, eh, aquí está juntando dos, dos, dos oraciones distintas. Primero dijo que eh, el tiempo tiene características geométricas como una línea, línea, Dios no, aquí. Y luego dice, el tiempo puede dividirse en momentos que transcurren uno. One after another. God cannot. The parts of time are related as earlier than and later than. God is not. Moreover, God is personal. Time is not. God has compassion on us. Time does not. God forgives our sins. Time does not. God is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is not. So it seems to me just wrong to think of God and time as identical. Um, so I don't have a knockdown argument uh, to offer for a substantival view of time. It just seems to me time isn't a substance. Uh, I dijo para el tiempo que no tiene un argumento derrotador para el tiempo sus sustantivo. Simplemente me parece que el tiempo no es una sustancia. And it seems to me further than in the other utter absence of anything happening, that that would be a state of timelessness. Uh, nothing's going on. There wouldn't be any before and after in the utter absence of any events. Uh, and so those are uh, the reasons for my uh, uh, inclination toward uh, a non-substantival view of time. 
Yeah, Ryan. So before getting on to some of your reasons for, you know, believing in a substance high view, I think it'd be interesting to have you guys like interact a little bit on some of the reasons that uh, Dr. Craig just gave. Yeah. So when when different people are saying that we are identifying time with God, that the claim is it's it's like a mode or an attribute of God. Uh, and if that's the case, then a lot of the objections just la- laid out wouldn't really make a big deal. So omnipotence doesn't forgive you. Eh, las objeciones que se acaban de presentar eh, en realidad no serían un problema, no serían gran cosa. This doesn't forgive you. Omnipotence doesn't have compassion on you. God does. Well, okay, that's a, well, who cares? No problem. Uh, same thing about time. You're like, well, time doesn't have compassion on you. Time doesn't create you. We're like, well, right, God does. Time is an attribute of God. So not really seeing the force of this once we get clear on what the claim is. Um, the other thing is, a lot of the statements made here um, about about time being tensed, I think these are statements about the timeline, about the moments of time. Uh, so time, I don't think is tensed, but moments are tensed or reality as a whole would be tensed. Um, and so, yeah, so I think what's going on here in a lot of these sort of cases, a lot of these debates is when people are looking at certain questions, they're thinking about the moments themselves or the timeline itself and not time itself. So this is a point that uh, Marcello Fiocco raises a lot in his work where he says, look, unless philosophers of time tell you what time is, all they're doing is having these debates about tense versus tenseless, uh, A theory, B theory, endurance, perdurance, you name it. Unless you know what time itself is. Uh, hablo de menciona, he hablo de teorías, eh, teoría del tiempo contra teoría B del tiempo, la teoría durantista contra la teoría perdurantista. Lo que sea, a menos que sepas que el tiempo es en sí. Is how do we know we're even having a debate about uh, reality itself or about time itself? And so for him, he's saying when we get clear on what time is, he lays out the view that I just laid out. Para que tengamos claro que es el tiempo, establece la opinión que acabo de presentar. Other than the God stuff, he doesn't seem to care about God. Uh, he'll say all those debates are about the timeline. They're not about time itself. That's 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 the strategy, at least. It seems to me, therefore, Ryan, that you you are not, in fact, saying that time is identical with God or to be identified with God. You're saying time is a mode or property of God, in which case it's not a substance because properties and modes are substances. So this is a, a non-substantival view of time of some sort. And I would wonder, what would be the difference between saying time is a property or mode of God, and simply saying that God is temporal. Because I agree with the latter statement. I think that God is in time. He experiences time and the succession of moments. But I wouldn't identify it with his property. So what would be the difference between identifying time with a property of God and simply affirming that God is temporal, which we both want to do. Yeah, so there's different motivations here. So Samuel Clark, when he's looking at this sort of stuff. Sí, hay muchas eh, motivaciones diferentes aquí. Eh, por ejemplo, Samuel Clark. He'll, he'll say, we don't want to say God's in time. Eh, we can say that if we speak in the vulgar. Él dijo que Samuel Clark, cuando él... Eh, está investigando esto cuando habla de esto eh, él dice que no que nosotros no queremos hablar o decir que Dios está en el tiempo que podemos decir eso si hablamos en, en un sentido vulgar statement is so that's just me quoting him so I'm not saying anything there's vulgar about saying God's end time uh, he says better to say God's temporal él dice que no está diciendo que hay alguna vulgaridad acerca de Dios eh, en el tiempo, sino que lo que él dice, Samuel Clark, es que es mejor que Dios, eh, es mejor, es decir, es mejor decir que Dios es temporal. Eternal, uh, because he thinks, it's like, there has to be something eternal. Uh, and that's the first premise in his cosmological argument. And then from there he goes, time itself is eternal. And then from there he starts giving you all these other divine attributes. And you're like, whoa, this is interesting. So, so one motive, historical motivation, at least for someone like Clark, is to go, this seems to be the way the world is. For someone like Raghunata Sharomani, it's a different context. The motivation there is to go, we've got this particular ontology where we've got space, time, the ether, sound, because apparently sound's a substance in, in our uh, ontology. Don't know why. 
Uh, and he says, this is a ridiculously bloated ontology. I don't need all these different substances floating around. I just need one. And it's God. I just need one substance that can do it all. And so it's sort of a, a way of kind of like taking like an Occam's razor approach and saying, I can have one substance that just does all this work. Now, that, that is pantheism, though. I think we want to resist that. I like the Newtonian Clarkian view um, that God is. Me gusta la visión eh, Newtonian uh, Clarkian. Uh, temporal has the property of being temporal, but I, I don't think we need to go beyond that to say that it uh, the time is a mode of God Himself, and and so let's leave this Hindu pantheus to the side and ask why. Pero dejemos de lado esta visión panteísta hindú y preguntémonos por qué. Should we disagree? with Newton or Clark, uh, as I interpret them, and just think of God as an eternal being who endures omnitemporally. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first, I, still, I disagree. It's not pantheism because you'd say some things exist in time and they're not identical to time. So you and I exist in time and we're not identical to time. No, but this fellow you quoted the... the yeah, and that's that's what the uh, Sharomity yeah. would say too. But it's the tipo que citó. Greg dice, por este tipo o persona que citaste, es, luego Ryan Mullins eh, menciona ahí, un, me parece, aquí donde dice Cheromi o Ramonia, parece que está citando, es un nombre hindú, eh, por lo que estoy entendiendo, así que no tengo idea de cuál sea su verdadero nombre, pero aquí es dice, ahí es donde, y este sería lo, creo que sería el apellido de ese autor eh, hindú, lo dijo al principio, no sé cómo se pronunció. Two. You only need one substance. Right, and that does it all. There's really only one thing that exists. For a certain set of categories, uh, for contingent beings like the successive universes, uh, all the different souls, all the different prime matter, and all that sort of stuff, that's not God uh, on this view. Um, so there, so it wouldn't be pantheism. Um, but yeah, so so back to the so looking at like a Clark Morian sort of sort of stuff. Here would be the idea if we want to give like a full story of the world and have a lot of metaphysical explanatory power uh, to try to account for fundamental features of reality, things like time and space. And if you don't think time and space are the sort of things that could begin to exist or that could be created, you've got a nice, neat package that you can give of saying if these are divine attributes. So you've got an eternal being, you get, and you got to get, get your eternal time. Por lo que tienes a un ser eterno, I'm, I don't know how I feel. Tienes también tiempo eterno about eternal space. I don't understand what space is, to be honest. But that's that's some of the views here. Is they're saying, like, I've got a lot of explanatory power in what I can do, all wrapped up in a nice theistic package. Well, Ryan, now let's go on to talking about your reasons for thinking that the relational view of time is false. We got some sort of motivations from Dr. Craig and now mm -hmm. maybe some um, anti-motivations from you. Uh, so so let's, let's hear those. All right. So I've got, I've got two problems I want to highlight for the relational theory. So the first is it's difficult to figure out what the relational theory really is. And then the second is the relational theory runs into different circularity problems. So let's start with the first one. So uh, W.H. Newton Smith, he comments that the relational theory of time, it's been so attractive to physicists and philosophers that they've not really bothered to articulate it and defend it. Uh, they just think like, it's just got to be true. Like, you know, it just has to be. But the lack of articulation, it leads to a theory that like, is so nebulous that one wonders what it could possibly be. So John Ehrman, he says, there are almost as many versions of relationalism as there are relationalists. And as far as I can tell, that's not a good thing for the relational theory of time. A theory that can be barely articulated, that's no theory at all. So that's a general idea with, uh, well, like, like for the first problem. Here's the second problem, though. So I think that a lot of approaches to the relational theory entail some kind of circularity. So the general idea within the relational theory of time is refusal to take time to be an entity or uh, within our ontology. So the relationalist wants to reduce time away to something more basic, some non-temporal entity. Por lo que el relacionista quiere reducir el, el tiempo a algo mucho más básico. Reduce time away to something more basic, some non-temporal entity that we already accept in our A una entidad no temporal que ya aceptamos en nuestra ontology. And how this reduction is achieved, like that's what's for uh, this, like up for grabs. But the goal is to offer a more like ontologically parsimonious picture of the world. 
But I believe that the different attempts to do this, they're going to fall victim to different kinds of circularity problems. So here's an example. So it's common to say that time is merely the measure of change. That sounds fine until you ask the question, what is change? Because most philosophers define change in terms of time. So let me give you an example of this. So D.H. Meller, so Hugh Meller, he says, change here I take to be temporal variation in the properties of things. By this, I mean that changes are things having at different times incompatible properties, properties that no one thing could have at the same time. So notice the circularity here. So change is defined in terms of time, yet time was supposed to be the thing that we reduce away to change. So that's an unfortunate sort of circularity. So let's look at one more attempt to get the relational theory up and running. So this is from Robin Le Pettivin. I'm not going to try to do his accent. I can't do the posh English accent like he does. It's, he's got such a good accent. Um, so he says relationalism. He says that time is just an ordered series of events. Each que el tiempo es una serie ordenada de eventos. Each individual moment identified with a collection of simultaneous events. And I want to say this isn't a good start either. So notice that the definition includes the word simultaneous, but that's a temporal notion which was the very thing we're trying to account for. And yet the problem, I think, goes deeper when you start asking other questions like, what is an event? So Ulrich Mayer points out that the standard definitions of an event introduce time into the definition of an event, and thus we get this vicious circularity. So Mayer writes, if events are made up of time... Aquí en el calde dice el nombre del autor Mayer, algo así Mayer, algo así dijo Mayer, me parece. ...then times cannot also be made up of events. So typically, when you look at your standard textbooks on metaphysics, they're going to say an event is a substance having a property of time. And you see this in Richard Swinburne. And then uh, Dr. Craig and J.P. Moreland, they have this nice book called Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview. And so here's the definition of an event in Philosophical Foundations. An event is the coming, continued possession or going of a property by a substance at or through a time. So again... Time has been brought into the story when it was meant to be explained by something more fundamental. And so that's one of several different kinds of circularity problems that I think the relational theory continually faces. Well, I'm not sure that there's any vicious circularity here, Ryan. Uh, it's just notoriously difficult to define time in non-temporal categories. So I think any circularity uh, here needn't be thought of as vicious. We can take certain notions to be undefinable primitives. Uh, so, for example, suppose I say that time is a relation of before and after dependent upon events. And you ask, but what is an event? And I say, an event is that which happens. Full stop. Uh, I have no further analysis to offer of what an event is. Uh, you just reach bedrock at some point that I, I, I don't think that you need to be able to um, give uh, a, a, an explanation in deeper non-temporal terms. And I think that your own view appears to suffer from this same circularity problem because you said initially, and I quote, the absolute theory takes time to be an eternal y cito que la teoría absoluta toma al tiempo para ser una sustancia. Toma el tiempo como una sustancia. ...caused substance. But the word eternal meant lasting throughout all time. So that the definition of time is circular. Mm. Yeah, so the relational view, as I'm seeing it, is, is supposed to be saying it's not a thing in our ontology, right? And we're reducing it away to something else, some non-temporal thing. And so one of the worries I have is, well, is this, is again, when you're reducing it to an event, is saying, okay, that's a non-temporal thing. And they're like, what's an event? And then you build time back in. And I'm like, well, that now it doesn't sound like a non-temporal thing. Uh, so we've got a problem there. And then if we want to take these temporal primitive notions, it feels a bit, it feels a bit odd. Like you might be taking the primitive notion or playing the primitive card too soon is another possible worry. So I'm still not seeing how to get out of the circularity. And then I've got this other worry of maybe playing the primitive card too soon. I don't know. I don't know if I explained that very well, though. I understand what you're saying, um, but I, I, it seems to me almost inevitable when it comes to time that you're going to 
Pero me parece casi inevitable que cuando llegas a, al problema del tiempo, reach notions like change, event, and so forth, which can't be defined in non llegar a nociones como evento, cambio, etcétera, que no se pueden definir en temporal terms. And I, I'm not attempting to reduce time to non-temporal features of reality. I, I think that's impossible. It, it's simply that I want to have a non-substantival view of time. And even your own view, as I say, is really non-substantival because you don't really identify God with time, but with an attribute or mode of God, which is quite different. So what about my allegation that your own view suffers from the same circularity by use of the ¿Qué hay de mi objeción de que tu propio punto de vista sufre de la misma circularidad al usar word eternal to define mm -hmm. what time is. la palabra eterno para definir lo que es el tiempo? Yeah, so I guess I wouldn't see quite the same problem. So if the relational theory is trying to say we don't have time is a fundamental feature in reality, so we've got to figure out another way to ground all of our temporal notions. This view is saying time is a fundamental feature of reality. I don't I don't see like why I'm going to try to start explaining things in non-temporal terms. Uh, there's a there's a reason why the world has to be described in temporal terms and why these notions of temporality are primitive, because time is a fundamental essential feature of reality. That's that's the idea. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm really deeply committed to that notion that time is a fundamental feature of uh, of reality. Uh, I think you're right that probably some relationalists do pursue a sort of reductionist program, but I have no interest in in some kind of reductionism, and 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 and, and therefore I do think probably you will be confronted with a sort of non vicious circularity. Ultimately, and I'm not sure any of us can uh, avoid that, but you and I are on the same page in not wanting to reduce time to what did you say, a non fundamental reality or something? There are non temporal uh, uh, no, fundamental no, features that are non temporal. No, we don't, neither of us wants to do that. Okay, well, I think we got some clarity on each of our, or each of your guys' understandings of time. So, again, we've been talking about time so far and I think now is the time uh, to do a terrible pun, <laughs> but now is the time to bridge into philosophy of religion and connect these ideas with like God, creation, and, and things like that. So both of you affirm that um, God is temporal, at least with creation. Uh, I dijo que ambos, tanto Greg como Mullins, afirman que Dios es temporal, al menos con la creación. But you disagree about God's state causally prior to... Pero no están de acuerdo con el estado de Dios causalmente antes de creation. La so creación. Um, let's start by devi defining divine timelessness and divine temporality. So um, Dr. Craig, can you take us through divine timelessness and divine temporality? Like, what do these mean? Sure. To say that God is temporal is to say that God has both temporal location and temporal duration. And to say that he's timeless is to say that he is not temporal. So these are contradictories. Um, Being temporal involves having a temporal location and a temporal duration, and being timeless is to be non-temporal. Yeah, Ryan, if you want to add anything. Yeah, and just, just to make clear to the audience, so when you're looking historically at philosophy East and West, everyone agrees that if God exists, God is eternal, meaning God exists without beginning and without end. Um, but there's different ways to interpret yeah, what... Dios existe sin principio ni fin. But I different this for a Muslim interpreter. Okay. What else you want to add on to that? And so the timelessness claim is going to be adding on these statements about no succession, no temporal location, no duration. Uh, eh, la ausencia de sucesión, la ubicación temporal, la duración. Mientras que. Uh, whereas temporality is going to go, yeah, God exists without beginning, without end. No one thinks God begins to exist. Well, There's a few crazy people here or there who say that sort of stuff, but but Bill and I are not doing that. We're not doing that. Uh, we're going to say God does not begin to exist because God necessarily exists. But at some point in the life of God, um, God's going to have temporal location. He's going to undergo succession. He's going to endure. Uh, these are the kind of claims from temporality. Tendrá sucesión, tendrá uh, duración, eh, permanecerá. 
Yeah. So d- as I like to think about it, I like to like visualize it in terms of succession, right? So under divine temporality, like God's going to undergo succession in some manner, like he might think one thing and then another, or he might know that it's 12 p.m. and then it's 12.01. Uh, Me gusta pensar o visualizar es, en, con respecto a lo que acaba de decir ambos, el término, en términos de sucesión con respecto a la de temporalidad divina. Como Dios teniendo una sucesión, la que tú podrías pensar que una cosa y entonces otra eh, suceden. Podrías saber que son las 12 eh, en punto y luego las 12 eh, con uno. Whereas, under divine timelessness, there is no succession in God's life. So, Mientras que en la, en la atemporalidad divina no hay sucesión en Dios. Anything that God experiences, anything in God's life is just kind of had in this one timeless moment. It's just all there and there's no succession. There's no one thing after another. It's just, yeah, it's just all there. Yeah. Kind of, as I think of almost a frozen life. But anyway, um, okay. Uh, yeah, another mind of the puzzle here. Yeah. If I might interject something here, Joe, I think you are right. But in talking about temporal succession, that is presupposing the truth of a tense theory of time, which in my view is the real watershed issue. On a tenseless theory of time, there really is no... Es que cuando habla del problema de la cuenca, cuando dijo eh, el tiempo es eh, tenso o es dinámico, eh, que en el trabajo de William Lake Gregg, ese es su, su objetivo, su, el paral es el principal problema. No tanto las posturas de relacional o sustancial. Oh, succession of moments one after another. They're all equally real and existent. Just like... Ahí está hablando sobre la atemporalidad divina. O en este caso más bien, ahí está hablando sobre la teoría B del tiempo. O la teoría estática. Like the intervals on a spatial line. The first inch of a yardstick is not uh, any earlier than the the second inch, and the second inch is not a six. Ah, la de la segunda uh, pulgada. Successor of the first. Uh, and, and so in talking about temporal succession, I think we're presupposing a tense view of time, which I think is correct, but it's good to be self-conscious that that, that is what we're doing. That's good. That's a great clarification. Actually, yeah. I, want, I want to reject that because so Natalia Ding, who is a contemporary proponent of the B theory of time, the tenseless theory of time, one of the points she hammers over and over is that there is an actual account of succession. It's she hammers over and over is that there is an actual account of succession. There's no account of temporal becoming, but she thinks temporal becoming and succession come apart. So Natalia Ding, que es la, la autora de la que estoy llevando también esta serie de de audiolibro de su libro Dios y el tiempo eh, Mullins la cita y ella dice que si hay una explicación o hay una teoría que da cuenta de la sucesión de lo que hemos estado de lo que han estado hablando ahorita Craig y, y, y Schmidt si hay una cuenta que es de sucesión pero que no es en términos de devenir temporal, que es lo que mencionaba Craig. Craig le decía a su Schmidt que cuando hablas de sucesión de eventos, estás hablando de devenir temporal, que el devenir temporal pues es la manera en que se describe la teoría A del tiempo. Y Mullins rechaza eso, así que no es necesario que uno pueda hablar de sucesión, en este caso, en este caso de eventos, sin, compr- sin comprometerse a la idea del devenir temporal o a una teoría a del tiempo porque Natalia Denk es una teórica del tiempo estática o una teoría una teórica del tiempo no tensa o una teoría del tiempo temporalmente descontextualizada so the ordering of the moments on the B theory is successive it is earlier and later than relations and she says those, those are successive ordering relations and you see this in a lot of other B theorists as well so you see this in Ted Sider and whatnot ves esto en, en Ted Sider aquí ves esto en Ted Sider y, y otros now what Bill can you what you can say is you can go 
Ahora lo que Bilt puede decir. Oh, I see they want to make that claim. It's just not coherent and reject it. Um, but I want to say at least I they really are going to the mat and saying like, no, 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 we've, we've got all the succession you'd ever want. Yeah, I think both of those are good clarifications. So we've got divine time assist and divine temporality down. And now tenemos la temporalidad divina, la tenemos la atemporalidad divina y la temporalidad divina. Now we can go on to um, the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. So Ryan, how do you understand uh, la doctrina de la creación ex nihilo? This doctrine. Eventually, we're getting to we're getting to the juicy stuff, audience. So, but we have to lay the foundations first. So yeah, Ryan. Right. So typically people say that the doctrine means that God did not create the universe out of any pre-existent. Eh, la doctrina significa que Dios eh, creó el universo a partir de ningún material. And that's fine, but that's not the full story when you look at like you know, Western history. So what I'm doing is I'm following a very standard uh, set of medieval definitions that, that actually you can trace back to some kind of earlier uh, pre-Christian era. So there's this really ancient debate that carried on into the Middle Ages between what's called a doctrine of eternal creation and a doctrine of creation out of nothing. So, so according to Samuel Liebens, he says, creation ex nihilo can be understood as the affirmation, and this is a quote from... from okay. Creación ex nihilo, se puede entender como la afirmación. Bam. The universe was created by God at some point in time, perhaps the first moment in time, before which there was nothing except God. And so Sam says this this doctrine is going to be distinct from eternal creation, which is the universe has always existed with no beginning. It is nevertheless God's creation. He is eternally creating it, giving it being. And so I want to elaborate on, on a particular point because sometimes people accuse me of making stuff up and sometimes people make this sort of accusation against, against uh, Craig's view as well. There's this point that I think has been lost in a lot of contemporary philosophical theology, and it's this idea of God existing all alone. So in the ancient and medieval world, it's assumed that if something begins to exist, it is preceded by non-existence. You see this take a huge role in a lot of Christian and a lot of Islamic debates about the temporality or the timelessness of God. And so here's what it means for the doctrine of creation out of nothing. So the doctrine of creation ex nihilo says that the universe began to exist, so it cannot be co-eternal with a God who lacks a beginning. And this in turn entails that there's some sort of state of affairs where God exists all alone without creation. And you see this explicitly affirmed by Christians, Jews, and Muslims. So let me just give you three quick examples. So Boethius. Boethius says, Now this our religion, which is called Christian and Catholic, is founded chiefly on the following assertions. From all eternity, that is, before the world was established, and so before all that is meant by time began, there has existed one divine substance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say, we affirm one God, not three gods. Um, but then he goes on to say that he did not produce it from his own substance, uh, that he determined to form the world and brought it into being when it was absolutely not. So you see that idea of something begins to exist when it's preceded by non-existence. Let me give you a Jewish example. So I just give you a Christian example. Let me give you a Jewish example. So Moses Maimonides, he says, in the beginning, God alone existed and nothing else. So you've got God alone, God and no cosmic stuff. Así que tienes a Dios completamente solo, nada de cosas cósmicas. Now let me give you an Islamic thinker, Al-Ghazali. He says, God brought the universe into being after its non-existence. Dios trajo el universo después de su inexistencia. And made it something after it had been nothing, since from eternity he alone was existent, and there was nothing along with him. I could belabor the point with lots of other historical sources, but here's the big idea. Creation out of nothing, it does involve the claim that God exists all alone. La creación de la nada implica la afirmación de que Dios existe completamente solo. And that's what reinforces the claim that God's not making the universe out of any pre-existent material. There really is God all alone, and he's free to create or not create. And I want to say this is important because, again, some of the arguments I've run, some of the arguments that Craig has run against timelessness, people just ignore this entirely and say, oh, God and the universe are always co-eternal. God never exists without the universe. And I'm going to go, I'm sorry, that's not basic church history. Like, we have to be, like, you know, if you're saying you're going to affirm certain Christian doctrines, you have to affirm the actual Christian doctrine. That's, that's the idea. Yes, I love it that Ryan has emphasized the inherently temporal nature of creatio ex nihilo. 
And this understanding of the doctrine is in sharp contrast with Thomas Aquinas's view, according to which creation does not imply a temporal beginning of existence. Rather, for Aquinas, it simply means that God is the sole source of being of created things. He didn't create them out of anything. He is their sole ground of being, and that's consistent with eternal creation. But biblically speaking, the idea of creation is inherently bound up with a temporal beginning of the world and hence a state of affairs in which God alone exists without uh, the world, without creation. And so I think that the, uh, that the view that Ryan is expressing is the more um, faithful biblical concept of creation. I would only want to qualify Ryan's statement, uh, quote, if something begins to exist, it is preceded by a state of non-existence. Um, that's not, in fact, what Samuel Laban uh, said. What Laban said was the universe was created by God at some point in time before which there was nothing. And so Laban's view doesn't imply that if time began to exist or, or if the universe began to exist, there was a time uh, prior to the beginning of the universe, a time of non-existence. What he says is that it means there is a point in time before which nothing existed. Yeah, so this is not Sam's view about what the definition of what it means to begin to exist. It's the historical Western view of what it means to begin to exist. So you can see this trace back to uh, debates over how to interpret Plato that influence a lot of Jewish, Christian, and Islamic debates over sh should we say that God creates uh, out of nothing or should we say that, um, that the universe is, is co-eternal with God. Uh, and so, and you see that really explicitly in the Al-Ghazali quote that I have, um, where he says, God brought it, the universe, into being after its non-existence. And then you see this also in Ibn Taymiyyah, who wants to reject creation out of nothing. He thinks... Aquí dice un nombre oriental. Desconozco cuál sea. It's awful. It's, like, it's the worst doctrine ever. I want to have a, a doctrine of eternal creation. But he still affirms that anything that God does create, it begins to exist. Any given item that God creates, it begins to exist after a state of non-existence. So this is like a deep, deep uh, understanding of how, uh, or the definition of what it means to begin to exist that you see throughout the Western uh, debates over these sort of things. That's, that's the claim I'm making. I think that's just a façon de parler, Lion, when they say... Aquí me parece que es una locución francesa, façon de parler. Si alguien de la audiencia ya sabe exactamente cuál es la, la locución a la que se está refiriendo aquí, lo podría dejar en los comentarios. And when they say the world began to exist after uh, something like that, because people like Ghazali and Boethius conceive of God as timeless uh, in its being, in his being. Uh, and, and therefore, it's just an almost inevitable façon de parler to say that uh, if the universe began to exist. Ahí volví a repetir esa locución. As then uh, it came into being after God had existed alone. But I, I don't think that that should be pressed for technical precision. Oh, oh, yeah, I want to press it all day long because I can't understand <laughs> the problems that they are facing without that. So when I look at Augustine and the all sorts of debates that follow from there, like the worries he has are about this exact claim. That if you Christians, you silly Christians, you're you know you're denying the science of the day that says the universe is eternal. If you're going to say the universe began, you have this problem of God alone, then God with cosmic stuff. So that's one of like the main arguments against like uh, like the doctrine of creation out of nothing you see historically. Oh, but but Augustine is the sort of prime candidate for the person who says that it's foolish to ask what God was doing prior to. Uh, creation because time comes into being with creation. He says God created the universe with time, not in time. So I think you can find this other current of thought that I'm describing as well and that Laban's correctly 
characterized rather than it's un apellido le está comentando Levance pressing this façon de parler to, for philosophical precision aquí de nuevo hacen hablan sobre esa locución para obtener precisión filosófica me imagino que se debe referir a alguna forma de hablar mm. Mm. ok well Well, I, I, yeah. we should for the sake of time we should just disagree, say, disagree yeah i was about to say um we do want to get to like the main meat of the disagreement which is the view of timeless sans creation de la visión de la atemporalidad sin la creación um so that's really what we're coming up to and we've got a good 20 minutes or something like that mm -hmm. to talk about that um so uh dr craig yeah you defend the view that um god is timeless sans creation and temporal with creation so can you explain a bit to the audience firstly what that means and then secondly maybe sketch a little bit about why you think that's true okay well as strange as this view sounds uh it does seem to me to be the best view of god and time and is entirely plausible Um, suppose you adopt a relational view of time. Well, in that case, um, with the beginning of the past series of temporal events, there were no events going on prior to creation. Creation was the first event. Uh, we don't want to say, I think, that God has lived through an infinite regress of events because this would just cause all sorts of uh, problems. So, On a relational view, there just wouldn't be any time prior to creation. Time begins with the occurrence of the first event at, uh, when God creates the world. On the other hand, if we adopt a substantival view of time, then God as the creator of all things must be the creator of time itself, and therefore uh, God must be timeless without creation since he creates time. So on either a relational view or sub substantival view, it seems to me that God must be timeless sans creation. But que en cualquiera de las dos posturas, tanto relacional como eh, absoluta, Dios debe ser atemporal sin la creación. Once time begins, can God be timeless well here i think it's very difficult to see how god can be timeless if he coexists with the temporal world in view of his real causal relationship to temporal things and his knowledge of tense facts which would be constantly changing so it seems to me that god must be in time since the moment of creation All right. Um, and Ryan, of course, you're not the biggest fan of the view that God is timeless sans creation. Um, so why is that? Well, so I should say I used to be because when I was 19 years old, I bought two books to try to understand God and time better. One was Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. That didn't help out at all. Um, and then the other one was was Craig's uh, Time and Eternity. And so I was like, oh, oh, this is this is amazing. This is the best stuff ever. So for the long for the longest time, I was like, Bill, whatever you're saying, it's got to be gospel truth. Um, but now now I want to push back. Yeah, they called it. Uh, at all. Um, and then the other one was was Craig's uh, Time and Eternity. And so I was like, oh, oh, this is this is amazing. This is the best stuff ever. So for the long for the longest time, I was like, Bill, whatever you're saying, it's got to be gospel truth. Dice que durante mucho tiempo tú eh, tomó el proyecto de Craig como, como el evangelio. Um, but now, now I want to push back. So, um, so yeah, so here, here's... Pero ahora quiere retractarse ya... Mullins ya no sostiene la visión de Craig de Dios atemporal sin la creación, Dios temporal con la creación. Here's the idea. So, uh, here's a question I get a lot uh, from a lot of different philosophers, some who are really sympathetic to divine temporality, others who want to reject it. They'll go, what exactly does it mean to say that God is timeless without creation and temporal with creation? What's the relationship between those two different phases of God's life? And so this is where you could run different kinds of objections. So you can't say that this timeless phase is temporal, temporally before. And like Bill, like you don't, I know we know. We all no puedes decir que esta fase es temporalmente anterior. Uh, como dice Bill. Well, no, you don't want to do that. Uh, because then you'd be saying God's temporal before he's temporal. That's crazy. And that's why you want to say he's timeless sans without. Right. Eh, es por eso que lo que quiere decir eh, sin, sin 
sin la creación, tiempo sin la creación, a temporalidad, a temporalidad sin la creación. But yeah, I don't think you could say that the timeless phase is causally prior to the temporal phase either. And this is for two reasons. So first, I take it to be a basic causal principle that efficient causes are temporally prior to their effects. In which case, the timeless phase would be temporally prior to the temporal phase, and that's going to be incoherent. Uh, and then second, it, um, so Bill, correct me if I'm wrong here, but if I understand the view correctly, the timeless phase is not causing anything. The temporal phase is simultaneously causing the universe at the first moment of, of time. Uh, so God is called the temporal phase of God is simultaneously causing the universe to exist at the first moment of time. And if that's the case, then there's no causal priority before the timeless phase and the temporal phase because the timeless phase isn't causing anything is eternally willing or desiring that a universe exists. But the temporal phase is the thing doing all the, the causal work. And then I don't think mere logical priority can capture the relationship eh, luego no creo que la prioridad meteorológica pueda capturar la relación between a timeless and a temporal phase either this is because relations of logical priority they can only obtain between things that are mutually compatible like the premises and conclusion of a valid argument so relations of logic the thing doing all the, the causal work and then i don't think mere logical priority can capture the relationship between a timeless and a temporal phase either This is because relations of logical priority, they can only obtain between things that are mutually compatible, like the premises and conclusion of a valid argument. So relations of logical priority, they cannot obtain between incompatible states of affairs. So for example, uh, consider the classical theistic claim that from all eternity, the father timelessly causes the son to, to, tempo, to timelessly exist. Uh, considera la siguiente afirmación de esta clásica, que desde la eternidad del padre atemporalmente causa al hijo para que exista atemporalmente. So you've got a timeless cause with a timeless effect, and so they're always there together. You could talk about logical priority in this case. The father's logically prior to the son, but there's no state of affairs with the father existing with the... En este caso, el padre es lógicamente previo al hijo, pero no hay un estado de cosas con el padre que existe the son. They're, 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 they're sin el hijo. Cada vez que pone sol se refiere a, al hijo, porque se, por lo que estoy entendiendo, hijo y sol se pronuncian igual. Y el traductor de, de YouTube, en lugar de traducir hijo, traduce sol. They're mutually consistent. Now consider a panentheist. So the panentheistic claims that God and creation are co-eternal. Considera un panenteísta, panenteísta, no panteísta. Me parece que dijo panenteísta. Afirma que Dios y la creación son eternal. God's logically prior to creation, but both are going to be co-eternal. And so as Alan Rhoda points out, logical priority cannot be captured by incompatible states of affairs such as God is undecided as to whether or not he'll create, and God is creating the universe. Those are incompatible states of affairs. So God's logical priority is consistent with the doctrine of eternal creation, but I don't see how it's going to be consistent with creation ex nihilo. And this is because creation ex nihilo involves incompatible states of affairs, God existing alone without a universe, and God existing with a universe. So I don't think logical priority is going to capture what's going on, because otherwise the panentheists like Benedict Gurka and Tom Ward are going to say, Well, that's what I affirm. That's, that's, that's the doctrine of eternal creation. Uh, so, Esa es la creación eterna. So the main reason I want to reject uh, Craig's view now is because I just don't... La razón por la que quiero rechazar la postura de Craig ahora es porque realmente... Really understand exactly what's going on between the timeless phase and the temporal phase. Yeah, you guys can go back and forth on this freely. Yeah. Okay. Eh, dijo y Smith, bueno, en esta parte pueden, eh, entre ustedes, eh, preguntarse y responderse. Well, I've already suggested reasons why we should think that God does not endure through an infinite regress of temporal events. Uh, ahí lo que dijo, mm, que Craig ya ha sugerido razones, ha, ha propuesto razones. Por la, cual no, por la cual no deberíamos pensar que Dios perdura a través de una serie eh, infinita de eventos hacia el pasado. 
Um, and I think that we can con affirm God's causal priority to the universe if we think of a cause as the causal agent who at the first moment of creation acted to bring the universe into being. Clearly, that agent did not come into being at the first moment of creation. So, the uh, agent cause of the or uh, por lo que la causa agente o el agente causal por lo que la gente causal del origen in the universe uh, does exist i think causally prior to the exist que existe causalmente previo no aquí no, no hay que tomar antes porque antes significa tiempo y la visión de Craig pues no existía el tiempo no eh, sin la creación. Entonces, aquí ah, utiliza previo, pero previo lo utiliza en una manera de hablar de que no tiene carga temporal. Que es como hablar eh, causalmente sin la existencia del tiempo, cuando utiliza previo. Sense of time in the universe. But I also think that we could construe God as being logically prior to creation. Um, I disagree. Igualmente, y lógicamente previo a la creación, ¿no? Sin carga temporal ahí. Como el ejemplo que estaba dando Mullins, de la prioridad lógica entre premisas y conclusión de un argumento. Y that logically incompatible states of affairs cannot stand in relations of logical priority. Take Alan Rhoda's example. Uh, the state of affairs, God is undecided as to whether... Dije, eh, tomen el ejemplo de Alan Rhoda. Alan Rhoda es el amigo que, está, que citó ese momento Mullins para objetar en contra de la prioridad lógica. Entonces dice Craig, toma en el ejemplo de la roda de cosas que Dios está indeciso. They're not, he will create, and the state of affairs, God is creating a universe. Well, that just is the classic Christian doctrine concerning God's freedom to create or to refrain from creation. Logically prior to God's decree to create a world, God is undecided as to whether or not he will create. So it seems to me quite wrong to say that logically incompatible states of affairs can't stand in relations of logical priority. Uh, finally, I think we could say that God is ontologically prior to creation in the simple... Recuerden, aquí, eh, en lugar de anterior... Craig utiliza previo, ontológicamente previo. Y previo en ese sentido no tiene carga temporal. Es una manera de hablar a falta de mejor, mejores términos. Que Dios es ontológicamente... Está en un, está en un estado de cosas eh, ontológicos uh, sin la creación. Sense that he does not come into being at the moment of creation. Rather, as Ryan insists, God exists alone without creation, and in that sense, he's ontologically prior to creation. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I want to make sure I get this. So, so there's three reasons uh, you mentioned. So, infinite regress sort of reasons. Um, and then you want to say, Rhoda, uh, I love you, but you're just wrong. Uh, you can have these inconsistent uh, or incompatible states of affairs. And I also redefended causal priority if we right. think of it in, not as event causation, but in terms of agent causation. La objeción Mullins acerca de que eh, está mal sobre el ejemplo que estaba dando Rhoda. Y dice, Craig, él dijo que quiere redefender la prioridad causal. Eh, si es que estamos en lo correcto, no como causación de eventos, pero en términos de causación eh, de agentes o de agentes causales. Y esa es la prioridad ontológica que estamos hablando. Y esa es la prioridad ontológica de la que estás hablando. Sí. Yeah. Right. Ok, so, um, the infinite regress, that's, that's fine, porque I quiero evitar un infinite regress. I don't want to have um, an infinite past at all. Uh, and there's, so Swinburne dice que él está de acuerdo con el argumento de Craig de la regresión infinita. No quiere tener problemas con regresiones infinitas en su teoría. Iba a citar a Richard Swinburne. 
o, hab o hablar de Richard Swinburr. Que Richard Swinburr ha estado cambiando su visión eh, durante los últimos años. Swinburr y Dean Zimmerman, they're gonna say, Swinburr y Dean Zimmerman van a decir que. Yeah, so when God exists all alone, when this pre-creation moment, it's a moment that doesn't begin to exist, but it's a single moment. Uh, because it's not preceded by non-existence. And I know, and I know, I understand where you're going to be like, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. Um, but that's, that's one of the moves they're going to make and say, like, I can agree with you. Yeah, we don't have an infinite regress. Uh, and there's some different Islamic thinkers too who, who do this uh, historically. Uh, there's a minority view, but there's a few of them who have this view that looks remarkably like Swinburne's, where you've got God all alone and they say, yeah, there's no, he's not preceded by non-existence. So that's fine. Um, and for all the Kalam kind of reasons. And then they go, and from math, once God creates, though, then you get the succession of all these these moments from there. Um, so the first moment, in a sense, is this this pre creation state of affairs. Could I interrupt? So you avoid the infinite regress. Ryan, at mm -hmm. this, could I interrupt, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Uh, oh, uh, that view is perfectly acceptable to me. Um, that is a view that I characterize as the Oxford School. Uh, of thinking about divine eternity, which characterized Richard Swinburne, um, Alan Paget, and John Lucas, and I'm I'm happy with that view, uh, and I think it's an alternative to my view. So, if that's your view, um, great, go for it. I, I I don't have an object. Well, I do have objections to it. I there you go. I, I think. <laughs> As I've explained in the book, God, Time, and Eternity, I, I think that my view is more plausible than yours, than that view, the Oxford School view. But it is an acceptable um, view uh, philosophically and theologically. So uh, that, that I think that that really, really narrows any disagreement between us. Mm -hmm. So then let's look at the two others. Um, let's look at the... So you wanted to push back on Alan Rhoda's claim. Uh, so... Uh, regresemos a la a sus afirmaciones que hizo so, uh, acerca de Rod, ¿no? Y sobre la prioridad lógica. When Alan Rod is looking at this, he's having a debate with Catherine Rogers. And so so Kate, she's wanting to defend the claim that God is timeless. Uh, and she's trying to defend God's timeless foreknowledge being consistent with um, human freedom. And and Alan goes, no, because logical priority uh, is is the move that Kate tries to make, saying God's logically prior to the universe. His decision to create or not create is logically prior, and and he's and Al Rota goes, no, that makes no sense. Um, you can't have mere logical priority here because you've got incompatible states of affairs. Uh, so God deciding whether or not to create, he's undecided. That should be have an open future. Is is the that's the move he wants to make. Yeah, can I interrupt again at this point? Yeah. Uh, that just seems to me quite wrong. And there, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not sympathetic with Roger's view of God and time, but she's she's right. This is this is classic Christian doctrine. Uh, and it, it comes out not only in the decrees of God that I mentioned, but in Molinism. Now, I don't know how you feel about Molinism, but logically prior to God's foreknowledge of the future— would be God's natural knowledge and his middle knowledge. And in that state of affairs, God does not know what will happen because he hasn't yet decreed which of the feasible worlds shall be actual. Um, so you've got a relationship there of logical priority where the states are incompatible with each other in terms of in the state of free knowledge, God does have foreknowledge of the future. Whereas in the state of middle knowledge or natural knowledge, he does not. But the one is logically prior to the other, and the free knowledge is explained in terms of God's middle knowledge and his divine decree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Alan doesn't like, Alan's an open theist, so he wants to reject all of it. Oh. Whereas I like my Molinism. I like my Molinism. <laughs> I but, didn't know that. Uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Rechaza el molinismo, él está abierto y dice Ryan Mullins que él, aunque no es molinista, sí, sí simpatiza, él le gusta el molinismo. Yeah, but I want to make those, those, those logical moments, I want to make them temporal moments because I want to say, John Dunn Scotus, I love that you gave us these logical moments. They're fun. They're a lot of fun and thought experiments, but it's just not really plausible 
Because what I have is in a single timeless moment, I've got God not knowing the future and knowing the future. And you can go, well, yeah, at the logical moment. Um, and so I'm like, what's, 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 what is, how, how is it from all eternity God's ignorant of the future and, he's, and, he, and he knows the future? That, that doesn't sound right to me. Um, and you can say it's in terms of logical moments. I've got the worry right. about uh, intrinsic, um, uh, like problem of temporary intrinsics, except you'd have to call it the problem of logical intrinsics. So the same kind of problems you have with um, trying to combine uh, a B theory or a eternalist ontology of time with an endurantist account of, of uh, persistence. If you say... Con una explicación eh, durantista de la persistencia. An object exists as a whole all at once, but it exists at multiple moments. It gets contradictory properties. So what you do to remove that is you introduce temporal parts. I don't like temporal parts. I hate that. That's why I want to be like, let's be a presentist. Get rid of it. Eh, él dijo que odia las eh, partes temporales, que por eso es un presentista. Eh, vamos a un paréntesis. Si ustedes quieren saber exactamente de lo que está hablando aquí eh, Ryan Mullins sobre trajo a colación el problema de la, intrins la in intrinsecalidad eh, lógica. Eh, y eso apenas lo, lo, lo leí en mi serie del audiolibro de Dios y el tiempo pueden buscarlo en mi canal de YouTube ahorita va a aparecer en pantalla por si quieren ver más a fondo de qué trata esta objeción que está eh, mencionando Mullins acerca de eh, de cómo este problema de los intrínsecos es un problema para los eh, durantistas como Craig It seems like you're going to have to do the same kind of thing if you're going, well, in a single timeless moment, I've got God existing as a whole, all at once, you know, because um, Anselm teaches us that's the uh, perfection that God must have. But now God's not knowing stuff at n the logical moment of natural knowledge and knowing stuff at the logical moment of free knowledge. Those are incompatible properties that he has all at once as a whole. So I've got something like the analogous to the problem of temporary intrinsics. And I know that we only have five minutes left, so that's a lot to try to... Yeah, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Craig. Okay. I'll just ask a clarification question. On your view, I hope that you affirm that God has from eternity past complete foreknowledge of future contingents and of the future. Craig dice, tengo unas cuantas preguntas acerca de tu postura. Dice, eh, espero que tú afirmes que Dios eh, tiene desde la eternidad, desde el, pas desde el pasado eterno o desde la eternidad pasado, conocimiento del futuro eh, contingente y completo y del futuro. Pero no dirías que, sin embargo, Dios es libre de no crear de manera que su conocimiento eh, podría haber sido diferente. But wouldn't you say that God is nonetheless free not to create so that his foreknowledge could have been different? Uh, that, I wouldn't want to put it quite in those terms. Uh, dice, me gustaría ponerlo eh, en esos términos. As it sounds like I'm positing some sort of counterfactual porque suena que estoy eh, proponiendo alguna especie de contrafáctico. Uh, power over the past. Uh, porque suena que estoy como si estuviera proponiendo alguna especie de poder contrafáctico sobre el pasado. Uh, or at least over the logical past. Something like... Al menos sobre el pasado lógico. That. Yeah. Do, do, I don't know. Do you, uh, do you understand the worry that I have? Yes. But I think having the distinction of logical moments escapes that problem of construing these moments as temporal but in any case this is extremely interesting Ryan. i'm, I'm glad yeah. we had this conversation yeah and I, yeah. I guess i have one question before we uh close this out and it's for dr craig so when and it's about your view on sort of timelessness sans creation um when we're looking at our ontological inventory that is our list of what there is cuando vemos a nuestro inventario ontológico que es nuestra lista de lo que hay de lo que existe Um, and I guess we could talk about our current ontological inventory and uh, what there is presently or something like that. Uh, I don't think we're going to want to include on that list God's timeless phase wherein he exists without creation. So it seems like in some sense it 
has passed away, like it no longer exists. But if that's the case, then it seems as though one might think that it sort of stands in a temporal relation, like it no longer exists. It was the case, but no longer exists. And you might think that timeless things can't stand in temporal relations like that. So um, the, I'll, we'll just I'll close it out with you just giving an answer to that question, and then we'll just offer some final thoughts. I, I fully understand that intuition. Um, and I simply want to say that it's it's purely a figment of the imagination to think of God existing literally, temporally prior to the moment of creation. Uh, you can think of God as logically prior, ontologically prior, I think even causally prior, but not... Logicamente anterior, eh, ontologicamente anterior, incluso causalmente anterior. Pero es anterior, recuerden, sin carga temporal. Not chronologically prior uh, to creation, and therefore you just have to resist that intuition that this state of affairs uh, is something that is in the past and has passed away. All right. Sounds great. Well, thank you guys both for this conversation. I hope it was very edifying for the audience. I certainly enjoyed it, and uh, I hope both of you guys enjoyed it. So, um, yeah, thank you guys both for coming on. I certainly enjoyed yeah, thank it. You. Thank you very much.